Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Christine Coons. I am actually starting this out with not too much of a history of doing a lot of videos online, but I felt that there was a need to present a lot of medical aspects of genetics. I wanted to start with this history of genetics idea <clears throat> as kind of a pilot to a whole entire discussion of genetics and where we're at today with uh, science and our understanding of DNA, genes, all of the above. So this presentation is a very simple one, not a lot of very significant references. Most of these are actually rel relatively uh, easily found online. There's some very interesting topics and concepts with this history of genetics that is very enlightening um, to see where we've been and where we're going and a lot of the big steps in between. So without too much ado, I'll do a brief introduction about myself. Um, that's me, I'm a board certified physician in internal medicine at the American College of Osteopathic Internists. And I have been practicing as a hospitalist in internal medicine for about 10 years now. Um, I was a former chief resident, and uh, I do teach at the Pacific Northwest University College of Medicine. And I think one of the important things to disclose is I have no disclosures. I have no connections to anything monetarily in presenting these uh, presentations, just mostly just to convey f information, convey facts. <clears throat> convey some very interesting insights with uh, genetics, and in this case, the history of genetics. One of the big things to talk about is genetics really actually is not a new concept. The terms that we use in today's lingo is certainly new. Um, they are about 150 some odd years old. But the concepts actually date back to roughly 10,000 years ago. And we actually see this a lot with farming and breeding. The farmers, um, breeders or shepherds knew that if you were to have a strong um, offspring from a, let's say for from sheep, that you would actually specifically target that sheep to mate with another strong um, member of uh, another sheep or ram or whatever. Um, to hopefully get these genetic traits that produce um, wool, to produce a, a, a ram that's able to protect itself. Um, these were actually aspects of that was well known back in ancient times. Um, this was not necessarily anything that was surprising. Um, the term is actually called selective breeding, and it's actually been used a lot in uh, the farming world. And a lot of people don't realize that, but uh, for example, dogs are a perfect example of this selective breeding. We're using genetics and uh, specific traits on these dogs to uh, tailor them to specific tasks and responsibilities. I have a picture of a dachshund here, and dachshund is also called a badger dog. And these dogs were specifically bred to actually hunt out or burrow out or ferret out uh, badgers. Um, they would actually be uh, bred small and short in stature so they can actually get into the burrow. And if you notice that their snout is relatively long, and that was intended to actually protect them from uh, an attacking badger if that were to happen. We also notice that their front paws tend to be more spade-like. So boxins tend to be actually relatively good diggers and can move in and out of that burrow relatively easily. That's actually how dachshunds came into being. If you look at other species of dogs, uh, for example, the Siberian Husky was bred as a very energetic dog and designed for uh, doing a lot of work. Um, this is why we actually see it as a sled dog in Northern regions is for that strength, that energy, that ability to pull, that desire to actually work and uh, you know please their masters by doing that. They're very happy and content by getting jobs done. Interestingly enough, we actually have seen this also with uh, a lot of the cereal grains that we have. And um, 
broccoli, cauliflower, and so on are actually another very interesting um, food product that we actually use selective breeding for. Um, wild cabbage is the precursor to cauliflower and broccoli. Um, it, this is a plant that was native to the Mediterranean and found very much on very chalky cliff sides. And the people of ancient times found that this was a desirable food product, tried starting to cultivate it and realized that there were certain parts of this plant that were desirable to eat. Um, and they actually specifically bred um, or um, fertilized uh, different parts of the plant or uh, connected, um, yeah, fertilized different parts of the plant to actually favor one aspect, one trait of this plant. So actually the food products you see there, broccoli, cauliflower, bag, uh, cabbage, kale, Brussels sprouts, collard greens are all actually based off of the same plant. And what's even crazier is actually all of these plants are from the mustard seed. Um, so I put up a, a picture of uh, the savior kind of, I always picture this uh, painting as the savior pointing to the tree. This is actually a painting of the road to Emmaus, but I always envision that the savior is pointing to a, a, a mustard seed or a mustard tree. And it always makes me wonder, you know, the parable of the mustard seed, if he actually knew uh, what was going to happen with the, the mustard seed and all these products that would come from it. Because all these cultivations, all these products were actually cultivated in approximately the same time as the Savior from about 500 BC forward. This is where it all starts. Um, Gregory Mendel is considered the father of modern genetics and is a colleague, a um, contemporary with uh, Charles Darwin. They lived about the same time and he is actually a St. Augustine monk. And as a consequence of that, he had a lot of time on his hands um, doing a lot of prayer. Um, and actually, the monks tend to do a lot of work in the midst of all this. They did uh, gardening, uh, did a lot of um, baking, if you will, but they had a lot of responsibilities around uh, the, the abbeys or the monasteries they, they resided in. He started actually studying peas from about 1856 to 1863. And everyone kind of points to the old biology book and say, well, he looked at certain aspects of the peas, whether they were green, whether they were yellow, the, the color of the uh, flower that it produced. He actually um, analyzed hundreds of different aspects of uh, the pea plant. And as can you can see from before, the patterns of you know, we, we expected with the, like the uh, breeding of dogs or these plants that we were able to cultivate um, different um, species, if you will, food products, he was able to take those concepts that was already known and apply them in such a way that they can be measured. And that's where Gregor Mendel becomes the biggest part of, or the father of genetics is he takes these previous concepts and he starts measuring them. And a lot of the terms that we use even now called Mendelian uh, inheritance were coined to be, through him, uh, the dominant traits and recessive traits. He actually used the word allele, A-L-L-E-L-E, -L -L -E -L -E, as this inheritable trait that could pass down from generation to generation that can be monitored and measured. The problem with Mendel is that a lot of his work actually disappeared for a period of time. He passed away in 1884. And his work was not really fully appreciated until about 1900 when people started revisiting his previous work and realized that this was an amazing amount of work and an amazingly new concept. So a lot of people started appreciating this and taking it into the next steps. In 1905, Reginald Punnett came up with this concept. Not only did he take this concept from Gregor Mendel, but started applying it into how you can conceptualize this and teach this, he actually also introduced these terms of heterozygous and homozygous and dominant and recessive. 
um, he actually wrote a book in 1906 called Mendelism that took the concepts presented from Mendel and actually turned it into the first uh, genetic textbook. In the late 1800s was actually when we first discovered chromosomes. And this is kind of a continuation of um, optics. As uh, we looked to the skies with a telescope, a lot of people realized that, oh my goodness, we can actually look smaller and smaller into the minute world by taking those optics and fine tuning them to look closer and closer to the small. And as they did that, they took cells from different plants and different animal species, and they observed them dividing under a microscope. And what you see in this picture right here is a certain part of a dividing cell. This is a, um, there are different stages to a dividing cell, and this one happens to be called anaphase. What they described with this is these chromosomes were dividing into these individual cells, and they realized that there was probably some, obviously some importance to this. They didn't know exactly what it was, but the evolution of trait or allele turned into genes. And of course, the, the term genes is what we use even now as we look at sequences of DNA that lead to specific traits or specific proteins. DNA was actually discovered in 1944. Now this is not the structure of DNA. This is actually taking the chromosome, looking at it smaller and realizing that it's actually composed of these types of sugars or uh, bits of protein that are called nucleic acids. Um, Oswald Avery actually looked at different types of bacteria and realized that if he took a harmful bacteria and a non-harmful bacteria, placed them next to each other, that the non-harmful bacteria could inherit the harmful trait from the, uh, the bad bacteria. And he was curious to, as to how that happened. So what he did is he took a whole bunch of bacteria, about 20 gallons of the stuff, and broke down all the cells and separated out the cell components into the DNA. He discovered that the DNA was probably, well, he termed it the transforming principle. This was what um, caused this bacteria to inherit this mutation that led it to being uh, harmful. Then we get into the very famous uh, Franklin, Watson, and Crick. Now, everyone, of course, remembers Watson and Crick as the discoverers of the um, structure of the double helix of DNA. But it was actually preceded by Rosalind Franklin, who did a lot of the groundwork that led to their discovery. What you see on this picture is actually the images that were used to lead to the discovery of the double helix. The way this worked was you took the same principles that Avery, Oswald Avery had before. You took all this bacteria, you uh, separated out uh, all the components by centrifuging or spinning down each of the components. You took out all the DNA, you dried it out into its crystal form, and then you started blasting it with x-rays. You blast those x-rays onto an x-ray film, and this is where you get this picture. Now, as you look at this picture, this is almost like as if you were looking down a um, toilet paper tube or a paper towel tube. You're looking from the top of the DNA all the way down. So as you look down through this, you can see, and I'm actually going to see if I can actually start marking on this. You can see each one of these black marks. Each one of these represents parts of the DNA structure. And they're actually specifically arranged. You can measure the distances between them. And you notice that there's a slight increase as you go farther and farther out. So this allows you to actually visualize depth as you look at this DNA structure. The backbone of the DNA molecule is this guy right here. So what Watson and Crick did is they took this work from Rosalind Franklin started analyzing it, started studying it, and then realized with a little bit of math, math creeps in and rears its ugly head, that this is the structure of the DNA molecules, a double helix.
keep in mind, this is not more than 70 years ago. This is still very young, and a lot of this stuff is very much in its infancy. Watson and Crick evolved this concept of the DNA structure and came up with this concept called the central dogma of molecular biology. This concept is the basic aspect of how we get from DNA to protein. This is the basic. There's a lot of variations on how this works, but this is the starting point. You go from DNA, which replicates itself into new DNA, or you can take that DNA and you can transcribe it into RNA. RNA leaves the uh, nucleus of the cell, transports itself into the ribosome, which is the protein manufacturing um, protein inside the cell. And that's where you get these long chains of proteins, which subsequently fold themselves into um, these globules and they go off and do their work. Since the time of these discoveries, we took a lot of these advancements. We took a lot of this, these chromosomes, these understanding of DNA, the uh, start of structure and how we actually measure it from person to person. We created this idea of a karyotype, which takes a person's cells, crushes them uh, down, look under a microscope and we can measure how many chromosomes somebody has. And we started applying them to medical conditions. And that's what happened a lot in 1959. There were several medical conditions, Kleinfelter's Down syndrome and Turner syndrome that we actually could visualize why they developed the way they did. Down syndrome is trisomy 21. In other words, they have 20, uh, three of the chromosome 21. Turner syndrome, instead of being an XX individual, is an X naught. They don't have a second X. And then Kleinfelter's individuals have an XX plus a Y. Along this uh, pathway, we have this amazing discovery in 1985 called well, this polymerase chain reaction. This is the start of really contemporary genetics. Sure, Mendel's the father of uh, modern genetics, but in terms of contemporary, this is where we start to have this massive and rapid advancement in understanding our DNA and genetics. Polymerase chain reaction basically allows you to duplicate DNA rapidly. And that led to this concept of, oh, we want to start actually measuring what these genes are. We want to discover who, uh, where they are, what they're doing. And in the 1990s, a lot of these genes were starting to be discovered and named and placed in uh, the chromosomes. This led to the idea of the Human Genome Project, which started in the 1990s and finished in 2003. And the idea behind this was to take all 3 billion of our nucleotides, that very base component part of our DNA, and calculate all of them, take all 3 billion and assign them to genetics or the genes, to uh, the components that cause these genes to turn on and off. Um, and we discovered that in the midst of all this complexity, that there's actually only about 19,000 to 20,000 protein producing genes in the human body, which is not a lot, all things considered. However, you have to realize that that's a very small portion of these 3 billion base pairs. What happens is there's a lot of other controlling sequences that allows these genes to turn on and off at certain times. As uh, time went on and uh, our the, the project continued forward, um, what was done by hand by biologists actually evolved into computers as programming and computers got better and better and better. <clears throat> and that allowed them to finish the project. Originally they said in 2000, but it, the project didn't quite finish until 2003 when they completed uh, several uh, whole genome sequences for individuals. The project cost about $2.7 billion and allowed us to actually take the further steps that we are at now. So where are we? Actually, this is the amazing part. And I think a lot of what is exciting in the field of medicine and genetics, instead of trying to 
see chromosomes or the DNA in of itself. Now we're talking about the interactions and relationships of these DNA sequences. How do they turn on? When do they turn on? Why do they turn on uh, or turn off for that matter? How do I get one protein to turn on? How do I get it to turn off? And this also involves the idea and concept of epigenetics, which takes environmental factors and trying to describe when genes are turned on and off. And the perfect example of this is if you live in Alaska, which is a cold place under normal conditions, your body is your body adapts to that cold weather. That's why when you go uh, outside, some people will say, I, in Alaska, I wear shorts all the time. Even though it's you know, 13 degrees outside, I'm still wearing shorts. Whereas if you have somebody who's from Florida, where they're accustomed to all the hot weather, weather and humidity, if you were to take them and put them in, let's say, middle of the United States during a spring, they're wearing a fur coat and jacket and boots and multiple layers of clothing. They're not accustomed to that. However, if you flip-flop them and spend a period of time in there, the body gets accustomed to it. The same thing happens as we adapt to different elevations. If you were to go from sea level to the very top of Mount Everest, you would probably pass out partway through the, the, the climb. So what has to happen is people actually pause at certain stages of the climb to allow their bodies to adapt. The other thing that we're working on is deciphering genetic pathways. Understanding that as one gene starts, how does it influence the next thing? Where does it go? Where do these proteins go and what does it affect on the other end? Because we are a complete body and we have different organ systems, the adrenal glands do have an effect in the rest of the body. For example, with the use of cortisol, which is the stress hormone. As it heals the stress of outside influences and increases its cortisol production, that cortisol goes systemic. And as it goes into different parts of the body, there is an effect that is happening with that. The other amazing thing that we're doing in medicine is we're taking these concepts and we're applying them to medical treatments. And the perfect example of that is in different types of cancer. What we're doing now is we're taking biopsies of these cancer cells and we're actually sending them into a genetic sequencer and analyzing the mutations that they have. Some mutations actually have medications that can tailor and target them specifically. And as a consequence of that, they actually open up the doors for further treatments or a better prognosis overall. The amazing thing now is, in, I mean, back in 2000, the Human Genome Project cost about $2.7 billion. If you look in 2019, in just the United States alone, genomics or the study of genetics in the economy reached about $295 billion. That's a huge amount of uh, money that's worked through this, this system. The, the whole concept of genetics has blown uh, tremendously. It's huge. And a lot of the things that we're studying is just taking these basic concepts and moving it forward. So those are the basic references I used. Nothing super exciting. Yes, you'll notice that one of them is Wikipedia, but I hope this has been helpful for you in understanding at least a timeline and really a, the rapidity of how much we've learned, especially over the past 20 to 30 years. Thank you for your time.